very shortly if you guys can come on in. So our next talk is Windows Kernel Fuzzing for Intermediate Learners. Uh, I believe it's a follow-on of this process of learning. Um, so really happy to have Ben here uh, to, to speak on this topic. Those of you who follow this topic know that he's been um, doing research and publishing things and speaking about this topic for quite some time now. I think one of the first of distributed fuzzing things I've seen was, was Ben's work. So uh, give him a big Hawaiian welcome and aloha. And I'll get this started. Yo. Hello? Yep, cool. Awesome. So, yeah, g'day. I'm Ben. Um, so, some of the slides, about three, have been presented before. Um, it turns out that after I wrote the slides, I worked out that this is not really a talk about kernel fuzzing at all. Like, it doesn't really have any fuzzing in it, and I'm not fuzzing the kernel. And I've got some really horrible, horrible images. So I'm sorry to make you suffer. So I did a talk like, can we turn me down a tiny bit, please? I did a talk one year where I had a little bit of pornography um, and some of my friends were like, whoa, that's way uncool, you can't have like naked women. So every talk I've done since then, I've just had really offensive fat men and this has plenty of those. Um, I, this is my second small kernel project. So this I've been like nose down for about six weeks. The previous one was about five weeks. So I'm not really very good at the Windows kernel. Um, but I have done a lot of fuzzing, like really a lot of fuzzing. And I'm, yeah, an old man. I turned 40 this year, which is why I changed all of my editor color schemes to cream. They used to be like black. And I have... A certificate. This is me getting my Windows internals certificate from Alex Ionescu. So Alex is important because he did a talk this year at SciScan about ALPC. Um, and it's kind of like if anyone that's a practitioner is going to want to go and read that talk if they want to write any code based on my slides as well because the they go together, so I tried not to cover too much of the stuff that's directly in his deck. Um, but it's a fairly new area. Like, this is the first time I've seen him talk publicly about it, although we've talked privately for a few years. So we're not fuzzing ALPC itself. Um, we're using ALPC as a vector. You could fuzz ALPC. Um, I personally wouldn't advise it. Like, it's all kernel code. It's been well vetted. It's, like, new, so I don't think they've screwed it up, per se. Um, so what we're really doing is fuzzing user land apps. Um, and it turns out that this is an attack surface for user land apps that a lot of people that write the apps are not expecting to be attacked, which makes it good. But before we even start to like get into ALPC, we do need to do quite a bit of shallow kernel reversing, unfortunately, because there's no docs. So I have this just because like it's like a slide that I like. Um, fuzzing to me now after, this is, I don't even know, the dozenth thing that I've fuzzed properly. Um, and after a while, you start to generalize the process in your mind. So the way that you think about fuzzing is really, you, you don't like go and say like, oh, I've got this impossible new project. Just like, well, it's just fuzzing, right? So you pick a target and then you work out the basic steps. Like, all right, well, I need to work out how I can deliver. I need to work out how to expose some attack surface. I need to work out how to instrument because I need to know if I won, right? At some point, you can send a whole bunch of junk to anything. Um, we had this trouble with some baseband fuzzing we were doing. 
Like I can send a whole bunch of junk to the baseband chip on a phone, but how do I tell if I won? Like unless I'm physically there looking at it, I don't know if it's rebooted, I can't get a debugger on the baseband, blah, blah, blah. Um, generation these days is actually almost the least interesting part of the whole problem. Whenever I hear kids talking about like fuzzes they've written and they're talking about how they're generating test cases, I'm like, what? Really? Like, you can just send random junk, mostly, for fuzzing, and it works just as well. I've got extensive stats that prove that almost up to the highest level, completely stupid, beats not quite the smartest fuzzer there is. And even completely stupid is still going to beat the smartest fuzzers there are sometimes, because they'll find different bugs. So generation, yeah, boring. Instrumentation, really, really, really hard. Scale is hard but boring. So we're going to presuppose that we've selected ALPC as our fuzzing target. I think it's a pretty good target because it's new. It's only in Vista, like since Vista. Um, it's completely undocumented as far as I can tell. Um, it's kind of tricky to program with. Well, at least I was really, really bad at it, so I assume that means it's tricky. Um, and it's in your Windows machine, surprisingly, everywhere. So if we win, if we, if we get a result, right, what are we going to achieve? Well, we can probably get Privesk to system, and I put system plus, because if you pop something like CSRSS, that's actually pretty much you own the kernel at that point. Um, so at least system plus, and I mean from anywhere. I mean from inside the most restricted, i.e. sandbox, blah, 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 because everything will let you make an ALPC connection. And there's no SIDS. Um, Alex has got some bugs that are memory helpers. Like, for example, he can just cause a process to allocate as many pages as he wants with whatever contents that he wants. So those sound really boring, but when you're like in the nuts and bolts of exploitation, those are really kind of good bugs. Like being able to get a process to map whatever memory you like. I don't know if there's a disclosure bug, but um, it's the kind of thing that would be in scope for these attacks. So if there's a memory disclosure, like any local memory disclosure is great, even for another process. And if I can get some kernel disclosure, that's good. Uh, DOS is trivial. Like, that's already absolutely done. And we could, in theory, if we found a bug in ALPC itself, that would just be giant. That would be own the kernel from anywhere on the network or anywhere from any process on the host. But that's that would be unlikely, in my opinion. So mostly we're looking at privesks. So the guys that are going to be wanting to run these kinds of fuzzes will probably be guys doing browser escapes, I would imagine. I'm not a practitioner. Um, so it's an, it's an IPC mechanism, effectively. Um, it's really, really beautiful. <laughs> like I was looking at it and thinking, shit, this is great. It's really well written. Um, sync or async, super, super simple API, really fast. Um, it supports good shared memory. So you can share memory with another process, but the whole thing is arbitrated by the kernel. So there's no, well, there are not designed to be any possibility of data races, time of check, time of use. Um, it's a really nice way to do Windows LPC. So they moved the whole RPC, and that means they moved also RPC DCOM onto this whole thing from Vista. So it's not, but imagine that it's a network, because that's, that's going to be your best mental analogy. Uh, the link I've got on the bottom of all of these slides, by the way, is Alex's talk, which, again, you should definitely read. So when we're looking at 
Windows RPC. We think we're making an RPC call or local RPC call from like my random process to some other random process that's running a service. So we'll see a lot of Barry, Barry the Colonel Otter. Partly because I like otters, but also he's a recurring character. And so Barry's going to say that, first of all, obviously everybody knows the Windows kernel. I, I can see in your eyes, you're like, this is like completely boring, get on to the good stuff. But just in case there's like one person that is not completely familiar with the Windows kernel model, um, between user land, which is where all normal processes run, and what we call the kernel, there is a hard barrier, which is this dotted line. Right? And it's like, you can't get beyond the glass. So to get from user to kernel, you've got to do special stuff. And inside the kernel is where drivers run anything that touches the hardware. And we've got a bunch of subsystems that I won't go into because it'll take too long. So the important thing is, though, that to get across this barrier, we need to make a syscall. So they call it a context switch. And you load up your arguments in, well, depending on platform, but in registers or on the stack or whatever. And there's a special instruction that you call. And then your process, as if you're running as the process, your conception of time is that I've made a syscall and it's returned immediately. But of course, there's like 11 billion processes and the kernel is servicing them all separately. And that's, that's all I've put in because that's all that's relevant so far. So the Windows kernel also has an object hierarchy. So a kernel object has a special header, which we don't need to know about just yet. But there are tons of different kinds of kernel objects. And so these go in a directory. You can look at them like a file system, right? And for now, we're good. So now we can say, all right, how does RPC kind of work? We're going to establish an ALPC connection between our process. So I don't actually send anything to process X. I ask the kernel for a handle to an ALPC port. An ALPC port is a kernel object. I don't get to touch it directly. All I get is a number that I can pass to my syscall that references this handle. The whole connection inside is completely kernel internal. So once I've established an ALPC connection, now I can send on top of that an RPC bind and get an RPC accept. But ALPC is a lower level than all of that. Right, so... Now we're like, okay, well, what does that attack surface look like? Tell me more about these ALPC ports. I want to know who's talking to whom, and I want to know which processes have ALPC ports that I can start to poke. This is like part of the whole like delivery phase. So you can get a tool called WinObj, um, and this is the kernel object directory. Um, I don't know how they've implemented WinObj itself, um, but you can see here the directory we're in is RPC control. So these are just RPC mapped ports that are running on ALPC. There are also many ALPC ports that have nothing to do with RPC. But so these are just the RPC ones. That's why they've got all like crazy OLE names. But you can't get information from WinObj about your ALPC ports. Like it just They've not written in support for clicky clicky um, for these ports, sadly. So it's like, all right, well, we need to now start to learn a bit more about kernel stuff. So we're gonna go and do some kernel debugging, which is nowhere near as scary as it sounds. Um, it used to be really tricky, so you'd have to have like serial ports or two VMs has anyone tried to do that thing where you try to get it working over a fucking named pipe and it never fucking works and it just takes you like a whole day to set up? Now, 
the debuggers all support this local kernel debugging, so we don't have this problem. So we start by looking at the kernel's view of some random process, right? I'm just going to pick services.exe. And so this process handle that we're seeing is the, the kernel's process object. And we can see its PEB and its like thread ID and blah, 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 blah. So that it's telling us about some user land stuff. Um, and so, all right, we can dump the ports that are created and used by this process. And again, we're looking at kernel handles, kernel object handles. So we see that this guy's got one port and it gives us the name, which is nice. And then we can get the port information for that port, um, which gives us some fairly handy stuff. So it's like, all right, well, if I know every process, I can go through and I could like manually dump all of the ports. And so like how many ports are there on your average Windows system? Well, unfortunately, it turns out there's really a shitload. Um, and so doing it manually would be wrong and bad. So we're not going to do that because we're hackers and we like to write code. So it kind of looks like my dad. It's terrifying. Um, I, I wrote this tool actually quite a while ago. So it's a Ruby wrapper for the WinDebug core DLL, so debug eng. Um, and I hear a lot of like Python guys come up and say, oh, well, that's just like some random Python tool, but it's not. None of the Python tools fucking work, and none of them properly wrap <laughs> debug eng, right? There are some that are plugins to WinDebug, so you can run Python from inside WinDebug, you don't want to do that. And there are some that are just written as a basic debug loop, and you don't want to do that either. So unfortunately it's in Ruby, and I now bitterly regret my choices, but you've got <laughs> kernel debugging, and you also have local kernel debugging, and you've got to do some pretty tricky stuff to get that, but I've talked about it before, so I'm not putting it in. But if you go to the GitHub, you can see all the weird little tricks you need to do. Anyway, so I have a fully scriptable wrapper to Windbag. And then I thought, well, while I'm being horrible, I could like put a JSON API in the kernel, and that would be so hot. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'll get local kernel debugging working with my Ruby wrapper, and then I'm just going to like hook that up to like a website and make an API on it. And so now I'm going to connect to my Ruby API running on Sinatra from Go running on my Mac box. And then everyone will be disgusted. <laughs> and that's what I've done. So this, li this little project is on the GitHub. And it turns out there's quite a lot of stuff you want to do to map it properly. So I'm using the ALPC extension heavily. I'm using Bang Token, Bang Sid, Bang Object, Bang Process. These are all debug eng extensions. So if you tried to do this from scratch, like by doing like DCOM or direct kernel object parsing, no, it would take you a year. Shout out to Snare. So, both hands for the demo. I'm hoping that I've still got everything running that I need running. Okay. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm not doing that. OK, 
Okay, so what I'm doing is starting up the bridge now, um, which is, as it says, a really bad thing to do. Whoa. And so I'm going to rerun this process, um, even though it takes a while. So can you see that? So we're connecting to we're connecting to the local like the VM's IP. Here we're highlighting system ports and we're serving locally on port 8001. That's probably not my Windows. VM's IP address anymore, so it's probably going to like spectacularly fail. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Boom. So before, like while that's running, because this will take a while, I'm going to come over here and hope that I don't have any porn open. And we're going to look at the first scan I did. And this is where I highlighted everything, right? So here. I'm looking at everything that's running as anybody. So for example, you see a lot of processes that are running as me, and we don't care about those because that's not going to be a privesc. So the scan that I'm really running is where I'm looking at just stuff that's running as system. So you'd think it would be like a smaller attack surface. But it turns out that we've still got gajillions of ports running a system. And what green means is there's no SID. Anybody can connect to any of these ALPC ports, which is surprising. So like VM tools, the, their system daemon, yeah, sure, you can like run an RPC port as system and have no security at all. That's cool. Um, and if we, are we done? Oh, no, we're not done. If we hopefully soon click on the ports, it'll give us some port info, but maybe I'm going to skip that for time reasons. So in the system process itself, they've ACL'd a few important ports. And in service hosts, they've ACL'd like a port. Um, CSRSS, they've ACL'd one, but there's still one that we can hit. So we can like randomly try and fuzz CSRSS. We can randomly try and fuzz services, local security manager, service host, sweet. So yeah, we can, so the, it wasn't working before because these are all done live. So when you click, it goes live and queries the kernel debugger again for the ALPC port info. Um, so we're seeing the same information we got before from the debugger, but it's, you know, live in a web app because I'm a horrible person. So... Now we know we've got like a pretty tasty attack surface. So it's like, all right, well, I can connect to tons of random system processes, but what am I going to send? So the first thing you would normally do as a fuzzing person would be say, well, all right, 
we need to look at existing messages and we'll use those as a template for our fuzzer and we'll mutate those and hope that we get interesting things. Um, so I'm like, all right, well, how do I do message logging for ALPC? Um, so the first thing I thought was, all right, well, there's this event tracing for Windows framework, which is, I thought, new. And so I go looking around MSDN, and I'm like, haha, there's like a start trace API in advanced API, like Advapi, and they do have a flag for ALPC. So I can turn on the kernel logger for ALPC messages. I'm like, sweet. So I immediately started like writing tons of code, which was a little bit tricky. And then when you invoke that from Go, it looks kind of like this. Basically, you set up a session properties struct, and you set a whole bunch of struct members to what they're supposed to be, and then you call this start trace API. And that all now, in this sample, is that readable? No? OK. So, no, back, back, back. I suck at computers. So in, in this code sample, um, we just like log into a circular buffer and it's like a 50 meg circular log file. Um, and the kernel does that pretty well. But unfortunately, I suck. And I could have just used XPerf, which has been out since 2008, <laughs> which is a gooey, clicky, clicky thing that's got a button that says, like, oh, do ALPC logging. Um, so, yeah, Googling is an important skill, it turns out. And even worse, I suck so bad that it does. It's not even in there. So I got the event trace output, but it doesn't have any of the contents. It's just got the message ID, which is completely useless. So, all right, that was bad. So then I was like talking to Alex, and I was like, ha! So there's this special switch. Like if you disassemble debug eng, you can look at the extensions, and you can find lots of the extensions have undocumented switches. So you just like ida debug eng.dll, and you can find all this cool shit. Um, you just need to turn on a registry key and use the ALPC log message extension. I was like, okay, that sounds awesome. But then the thing is, there's this undocumented symbol. Um, but, and I didn't know this, and this is actually the thing that I'm probably happiest about from the whole project. You can just get a random existing PDB you write like, this is the whole .c file. You write a C file that has a struct declaration for your undocumented or private symbol. Um, and I'm just doing the struct def and declaring a global variable of that type, right? And then using the command line compiler, it'll just add that symbol to your existing PDB. So if there's any like private symbols that you've reverse engineered out or like stolen from somewhere, you can take a public PDB, write a tiny bit of C, and they'll now be in your symbol file. So they'll show up in IDA, they'll show up in Windbag. It's a really cool trick. Like not x86 for me, like x64, but unfortunately, like that only works in Vista because Alex is a dickhead and he forgot to tell me. Um, but the symbol trick is really cool. So if you can get a debug build, or if you're on Vista, then yeah, okay, maybe you could use this. So I'm like, all right, fine, 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 fine. I've got a debugger, I'll do that. Like, this is a normal syscall gate. Um, and this is what most of the native API things look like. Um, so with the, you don't see the args being set up because they're set up somewhere a little bit higher. Um, but it's moving the syscall number into EAX and then syscall. So what that does at that point is the context switch. And when I return from syscall, my message will magically be in the buffer that I assign to receive my ALPC message. So if I break at this syscall, so after the syscall has happened, 
I can, this is the protocol, so this is the um, function signature. And we see that like on x64, the fifth arg is gonna be ox28 because maths. Um, even though, in case you didn't know, like even though fastcall uses register arguments on 64-bit, they still reserve the same amount of space. I don't exactly know why, I haven't looked at it, but they still reserve space for the first four args. So your stack args are still gonna start at OX28. Um, this is some Ruby code. So I'm reading a pointer from RSP plus 28, and then I'm reading virtual from that offset. Like that's the pointer to the message. Two bytes in is the message size, and then I'm reading the rest of the message from memory. It's pretty simple, and that works, which is nice. So I have this in for other people that will do presentations in the future. Like any time you've tried something and it hasn't worked, you probably still wanna put it in your talk because it turns out that we all suck, in my experience, and I personally learn a lot more from talks that include stuff that didn't work, because like, oh, I would have done it that way, and that would have been wrong. So present your failures. Um, so yeah, LPC log. Um, I'm really low on time, wow. No. Come to me, correct. Damn it. All right, what I'm going to do is actually skip this demo and say I did it. Um, it looks like this. Um, and it'll just dump out all of the ALPC messages received by any process, but in theory I've got 13 minutes left, so we're gonna not do it. So we're gonna talk about, we've, we've dumped out messages coming into a process, so now we're gonna talk about, all right, like let's actually do the thing, let's do like some connection. If you can't build it yourself, then you probably don't know how the protocol works. Um, there's not much doc, the new edition, I think the seventh of Windows internals is gonna have some stuff because I've proofed Alex's chapter for it. Um, some of the LPC stuff that Juro's done is worth looking at even though it's not LPC anymore. And you can get the ntlpcapi.h online, which is good. And there's a GitHub project that some guy's written in C. It doesn't look like it'll work properly to me, like it looks really sketchy. Um, but some of it is worth like casting your eye over. I'm using Go because I'm basically an idiot. Um, but it means you can statically compile a binary. So for example, I can build a binary on Windows and Go always completely statically links. So I can then ship that binary to anyone. Um, which is not the case for scripting languages. So ALPC looks like this. You connect port and you give it the name of a connection port that's running on the service you want to connect to. The server calls accept connect port and so once that's been done, we've now both got a communication port and those are anonymous. So all of the on the debug output, like, I don't know, like 15 slides ago, all of the connection ports, which is most of them, are all the ports that like a random process talks to a server on. But you're waiting as a server on your connection port only. So your receive loop is like single threaded and beautiful. You don't have to spin a thread to wait on every port that's talking to every client, um, which, is nice. So, uh, I don't know who this guy is. I just found his blog online. He's terrifying. 
So this is the basic connection. So I'm connecting to the server name, which is a string. I'm setting up some flags. The server, these, these slides are mainly here because like someone's actually gonna go and use this code and write a fuzzer. And like it might not be someone that's here or it might be, but these are slides that are more meant to be on the record than engaging presentation material. Um, we're accepting, and in our receive loop, which is cool, we just use the same buffer um, because it's on, the, on, on either side of the syscall. So when we, when we call send receive, the send and receive happen from my point of view from user land instantly. So I syscall and my buffer gets magically replaced with the response to my ALPC message, which is fast and memory efficient and awesome. So, all right, well, if the server only waits on its one connection point, then how do we dispatch to multiple clients? Because all of these messages are coming in and like, I don't know like where I'm actually responding. And so the, the ALPC messages have what's called attributes. Um, and so there's a few of them. The important, well, the most important one if you're writing a server is the context attribute. So when you accept a port, you can accept it and also pass a pointer to an opaque struct, it's, which is a programmer's term for whatever the hell you want, right? So I, when I accept a connection, I can save a pointer to whatever I want, and when I receive every new message, I can get that pointer back. So for example, I can say like, oh yeah, by the way, this was Fred on accept. Now every message I accept, I can look at the thing, get my pointers out, oh, that's Fred, right. Fred's on like handle OX7C, right? You can also put data views. If you're gonna start poking it, then the, the data views are deeply interesting. That's how you do your shared memory. Anything that's too big for a normal ALPC message, which is 64K now, goes in a data view attribute. Handles, security attributes, meh, not that interesting. Um, unfortunately, these are secured by the kernel. So all of the things that you're immediately thinking if you're a dirty hacker probably won't work because the kernel is gonna sanitize all of your data view attributes and stuff. If you try and like lie about your process ID and your message, the kernel's gonna fix that for you. So, sadly. So the, the terminology they use for these is capture and expose. So here I'm, here I'm capturing a thing and I've set up my own little struct where I've just got a handle member And so as I accept, I'm accepting with this port context, which is a pointer to my little struct. And so then in my receive loop on my server, I just do a pointer cast of, apparently this is the way you're supposed to do it. It looks kind of dirty to me, but you do, you do a pointer cast of a random blob of memory to be a, a context attribute, and then suddenly you've got your handle back. So now I know where to respond. So what did I do wrong? Well, I think I did everything wrong at least once. So I've got an extensive list of how not to do ALPC programming. Um, my biggest tip is to get your NT status errors because I don't know why and it's kind of cool, but they've been really granular in the errors. So your return code from the syscall um, will probably tell you exactly what you're doing wrong always zero out buffers. Like the kernel's really strict about what it will accept because it thinks you're lying, right? So if, you're, if you've got an old buffer um, where the callback or anything is wrong, the kernel will just say, yeah, no, I'm not gonna send that, bro. You're just lying. So it's better to start with a clean message. Um, in general, this goes for any kernel programming. If you see like a, a struct length field, you're probably better off like setting it properly and make sure you're using flags that make sense. So, I don't know, is, is Rich here? No. So my code's already online, because I put it up before I gave my presentation. Um, 
some of us actually release our code. Um, so you can get all of the fork of Win32 that I've made to work with Go, that's already there, and you can get a bunch of stuff in this ALPC Go repo. So that's got a high-level Go API, which no one's ever going to use because I'm apparently the only person in the world that writes Go, but ALPC Bridge is a JSON RPC API to that. So that means that whatever language you use, and it's probably going to be Python because no one but me knows how to write code, you can like still connect, fine, whatever, have your Python support. Um, so am I releasing an actual fuzzer? No, screw you guys. Um, I've got a few things I need to do to the API. Um, it supports messages now already. You can send whatever you want. I want to add better attribute support so you can send random malformed attributes along with, this, this is to the JSON RPC, right? So you can send random malformed attributes along with your general fuzzing. LRPC is actually a bit harder. Like if you've seen the tools that people are writing to try and decompile middle to get the RPC stubs, it's a hard job and no one's yet done a acceptable job in my view of it. So for me, I think it's going to be hard, but so ALPC is your base layer, right? If you want to fuzz RPC properly, then you might want to be RPC aware. I'm not yet. It is possible to do a, a man in the middle fuzzing proxy. So you need kernel access, but you can actually swap out the port object at the kernel level. And then you could put in a, a, a proxy that'll take real connections between real processes and fuzz those like man in the middle style. And that'll probably rain bugs, but I'm not going to release that. Um, but you, like, if you just want to, like, fuzz ALPC for some random process, like, VMware on, like, your VMware daemon on your VMs running an ALPC port that's open, there's, like, dozens of system ports. So easy. Like, all you need to do is get a generator. I would suggest Redamza and use JSON RPC. You can use whatever nub language that you people use. You can use curl and like have a fully functional fuzzer going in, I would say, less than a day. And you should do it because nobody's looking at this stuff. Instrumentation, I, I use whatever I normally use to get user land exceptions. Um, you can use the app verifier. I don't, I have a, a custom thing that's built on the debugger. Um, what you're gonna probably see though is a lot more than usual exceptional conditions. So you're going to see like memory leaks and handle leaks. Um, radar is a pretty good thing for those, which is a Microsoft thing. Otherwise, the, there's a lot of triggers in proc dump that you, you can use. So you can say like, if process X gets beyond this memory threshold or this CPU threshold or this handle count, then give me a memory dump of it. Because um, I think that the real gold is probably gonna be in weird memory bugs. You're gonna see disclosures and leaks. So that's how I would suggest instrumenting. You might hit a blue screen, because anything that's like talking to CSRSS or LSAS or whatever, you've got a reasonable chance of like blue screening the whole box. I still don't have what I consider to be a good way of instrumenting that. Um, so what I do for my kernel fuzzers is literally just tell it to log the blue screen to disk and I have a thing that runs on startup and it says like, is there a dump file? If there is, it sends it off to a queue and then that gets processed by a triage agent. Um, if anyone knows a better way of doing it, then please, please, please tell me because I'm deeply interested. Um, but at least that does work. And with one minute and 24 seconds remaining, um, that is pretty much the wrap up, I reckon. Um, obviously, Alex was hugely helpful. Like, I had like, I reckon six 
DMs from him during this whole project, but each one saved me a week of work. Um, and oh yeah, Barry says thanks. Everyone loves Barry. We love you, Barry. And there we go. If, if anyone can tell me the uh, what what this particular slide is about, then there's probably a prize. It's a quote from a friend of mine. But yeah, I'm good for questions now. <laughs>